is if, if, if Dr. Uh, right. Meyer keeps on adding uh, his uh, intelligent design argument there, he's retreated out of science once again. It's supernatural. It's not a testable hypothesis because he will not allow it to be falsified. It is testable, and it's testable in the same way all historical scientific theories are testable. You ought to know about the method of historical scientific reasoning. I show in the book, Signature in the Cell, that the case for intelligent design is based on the same method of scientific reasoning that was used by Darwin and by Lyell. And that method is a method called the method of multiple competing hypotheses, standard in geology, where I was also trained. And, it is te and, and the hypothesis of intelligent design is testable by comparing its explanatory power over and against its competing hypotheses. And it's also testable by comparing the predictive success of the theory. The theory, for example, has predicted that the so-called non-coding regions of the, the genome, which were said to be junk by the Darwinists when it was first discovered, and w was affirmed to be junk by Michael Shermer as recently in his, his 2008 book. Intelligent design advocates have been predicting since the early 90s that the non-coding regions of the genome would be shown to be importantly functional. Those predictions have been confirmed. In fact, overall, the non-coding regions of the Excuse genome... Excuse me, that's incorrect. Like Th that is correct. Incorrect. No, that I have is it right in front of me here. Uh, I don't think you want to argue about junk DNA with Richard Sternberg at my site. He's writing a book uh, about it. I'm happy to. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. I did a whole bunch Gentlemen, of research we, on we this. we don't have time for that, I'm afraid. Oh. We're going to have well, to go I to have the rebuttal if anyway, wants to Anyway, Intelligent it. Design has made a prediction about, the, about right. junk DNA not being junk that makes it scientific. We think the evidence has come in overwhelmingly. In fact, it's not we. It's coming in in the scientific literature every week that shows that the junk is not junk. It's importantly functional. Okay, well, let me answer yeah. that one before it uh, gets uh, passed over. Uh, it turns out, yes, the early naive Darwinists before this discovery of, uh, of nucleotide sequencing uh, thought everything was functional, and so they were shocked to discover in the 1960s with uh, the, the very beginning of uh, uh, DNA sequencing and, and actually from the very primitive techniques they had, like uh, gel chromatography, that there was a lot more DNA than need, seemed to be needed. And the basic thing is that there's a whole series of things in the DNA that clearly cannot be functional, that are junk. We don't know how much is junk, but enough of it is that it's clearly non-functional. I'll bring up one that was uh, thrown at Dr. Meyer in Oklahoma a few weeks ago and apparently didn't know how to answer her, and that's endogenous retroviruses. These are vi retroviruses that insert their DNA back in, or their DNA back into your cells when they infect you or when they infected your distant ancestor. They lock that in and then your cells carry this, it's sort of like a scar tissue. You carry this dead virus DNA, generation after generation after generation, no longer capable of producing those viruses, is evidence that you were, your distant ancestors were once infected and it no longer has a function. And everybody who works on that agrees there's no possible functionality to this. It's completely non-coding. Pseudogenes are also one function, once function genes that have lost their coding. Uh, maybe some portion of what we used to think was uh, non-functional turns out to be functional, but most of it apparently is non-functional and non-coding. You can see that very clearly if you look at things like how much DNA it takes to make an organism. Frogs and salamanders, uh, excuse me, ferns and salamanders, which are, most of us can see, a little bit simpler than us, have a hundred more times more DNA than we do. There's even an amoeba, uh, which is called Protopolycaeus debium, which has 200 times the DNA of a human, just to make an amoeba, okay? Clearly not much of that is in use to make something as simple as an amoeba. An onion, one species of onion has five times the DNA that humans have, another species has 20 times. These are two species in the same genus Allium. Uh, clearly that can't all be functional DNA if you have that much variation within a genus and that much variation from the simplest amoeba all the way to things like frogs and salamanders. So there's a lot of DNA that's not coded for, and I would say that majority, by far, of the people who actually work on this would say that most DNA is still non-coding. Doc, Dr. Prothrow, you're a geologist. We have a genomics expert to my right who'd like to comment. I also had a degree in biology, and I've done a lot of work on this. Uh, well, this yes, is a competition I, between I, uh, who's uh, got <laughs> more of a degree. Um, uh, oh, you'll I, have the a final facts. comment, and well, I'm going to go to okay, questions. I, I want to respond on the retroviral um, sequences topic. Um, He's absolutely right. There are hundreds of thousands of copies of these retro, these virus-like sequences in our chromosomes, chromosomes of mammals and fishes and, and uh, uh, even the yeast cell. Now, what's interesting is that he's wrong on a number of points. Here's the first point. One of the first class of sequences to be expressed shortly after the first or two-cell embryo, that is from the zygote, including our zygotes, mouse zygote, to the two-cell stage embryo, first class of sequences, are the endogenous retroviruses. And you know what's determined in 2004 is that if you knock those sequences out, you block their expression, 
you stop embryogenesis at the four cell stage. Actually, it's cited in a paper that Jim Shapiro and I, uh, um, one of the papers published in 2005, where we uh, dealt with this uh, topic, the, this whole issue of why the so-called junk DNA is functional. Here's another example. What holds the placenta together um, is a, a class of proteins, and they're essentially, they form tethers. Now, and the proteins, the proteins that are coded are, are specified by retroviral-like sequences. It's different in the mouse than, than the ones in the human. If you look now, there are these switches that flip gene sequences on and off. They're called promoters. Uh, like you can think of them as molecular toggle switches. A recent analysis of the number of these genetic switches in our genome contributed by these endogenous retroviruses, so many of them they just have to be garbage, 181,000 roughly. So, and you look at the literature, what they're doing now, and this is the ENCODE project was published in uh, 2007, a series of papers where they looked at not just the sequences, but the expression of sequences, how they're copied in RNA. And what they found, to their surprise, is that most of the expression is taking place in this so-called non-coding DNA. And you can find papers nature and science, genome research, genome biology. Thousands of them are out there now. Go to pubmed.org again, just type in junk DNA and see what you pull up. Don't take my word for it. But what you'll find is that when they investigate these classes of sequences, as numerous as they are, they're finding a whole series of functions. Pseudogenes, for example, so-called pseudogenes, their expression regulates uh, yes, they don't code for proteins, that's true. Do they look like defunct copies of other genes? Yeah, they do. But you have two papers back to back in nature, and what they demonstrated is that, well, those so-called non-functional RNAs, the transcripts, are regulating other genes. And I'll be happy to provide you with the PDFs and with the references for those papers. Okay. I have a comprehensive list on page 407 of Thank my you. book.